Okay, sorry. So, this talk is how organizations can work to train to build for and maintain new projects on the maps. My name is Hunter. I'm the founder of Debug Academy. I have uh, started Debug Academy a little over 10 years ago. Um, I have a bunch of Aquavia certifications, um, and I actually worked as an architect at Aquavia for a period of time. Um, and, oops, yeah, we, as the American Academy, of course, we do training. Um, some of the courses we have, some of the more popular ones we have are the Become a Google Developer course. This is a part time pre month course for people who are looking to become a Google Developer, uh, regardless of your background, whether you have a software background that may be non Drupal or you do not yet have a technical background. This course will take you through the command line, through HTML, CSS, Drupal site building, Composer, etc., and prepare you to be a Drupal developer. Um, we also have Aquavia certification prep courses for those of you who may already be developers but are looking to become Aquavia certified. We have a few of those courses as well. And various other courses. If you go to debugacademy.com, you'll see the full list, which includes our architect series. Um, for people who maybe have built multiple Drupal websites but want to see how to do it better. And of course, thank you to all the sponsors for Drupal.com. It's great to have an event like this that is completely free. Um, and uh, you can compare it to something like Drupal.com where it's almost $800 a ticket, so it's pretty nice. Uh, nice that we all have this event to come to every year. Now, this talk is Focus on deciding what type of training is appropriate for you or your organization. And the thing that you know, gave me the idea to do this talk is I find that I have the same conversation with a lot of different people um, who maybe they come to our website, they set up a meeting, and then they basically say, I want training. By the end of the call, they realize the training that they actually need is not what they were asking. So that's, that's the, the focus. So before we focus, before we discuss what training might be appropriate for you, let's talk about what training options there are. And some of these are obvious, some, some are, um, some might be less so. Uh, but we'll break it down into categories, which can be sort of mix and match, uh, to determine which trainings uh, fit for what you're interested in. Um, so first of all, there are public trainings and there are custom trainings. Um, the main difference between those, when we say public training, it's not necessarily free. But public trainings would be the trainings you, have, you see at GovCon here, um, trainings that you go to training.aquia.com, you sometimes see a list of training uh, offered by Aquia training partners, like our company, um, and others as well. Um, so these are basically trainings that are scheduled, you know, specific hours, and maybe by. Uh, custom training, like it sounds like, you talk to a trainer, you tell them exactly what you want to learn, they'll schedule it with you for your team and do a training directly for you. Uh, so in our, our organization, the you know, academy, we do those, we do both of them. There's a lot of options out there. Um, and then there's trainings that are hands on and there are trainings that are listening. So this morning I taught a, a, a session, um, but really it's the same as any training. Um, the only difference is it's not hands-on. Um, so hands-on trainings are where you're going to have a Drupal environment in front of you that you can interact with, where you can actually do the work. Listening uh, is one where the instructor does all the work. Um, and you'll find that this the, the hands-on versus listening doesn't necessarily correspond to beginner versus advanced or you know introductory versus thorough. Um, we have advanced courses that are hands-on, we have advanced courses that are hands-off. Um, our architect series um, is a hands-off course. It's because architects often have the background knowledge so that we can speak more quickly, cover more material um, than we could if it were hands-on. Um, and you know, we basically can cover uh, a larger amount of material in less time. So that's really the benefit of a hands-off training that the amount of material covered is greater. However, if the training is hands-on, you're more likely to 
to retain what you learn and more likely to be prepared to apply what you learn after the course. So it's not that one is better, uh, but they have their own characteristics that affect the outcomes. There's a flipped classroom versus in class. Um, the difference between those two is flipped classroom, the bulk of the, of the studying happens on your own time, essentially through homework. Um, whereas in class, you pretty much do not necessarily have any homework. And you learn everything and you may or may not do hands on tasks in class. Um, so, flipped class, again, you know, there's, there's time and place for each of these. For the flipped class, that might be appropriate when there's a lot of material, but the attendees don't necessarily have a lot of time to devote to live classes. Um, so, for this one, we, we often do our, our, our uh, certification prep courses as flipped classes. So, we give you study material that we create, you spend the week reviewing it, and then in class, we allow for Q&A, for anything that you might have not understand, understood, we can do deep dives on those. We uh, do sort of pop quizzes and certification exam. That's, that's, that's the goal, is to be able to pass a quiz. Um, so we do pop quizzes um, and, um, and that sort of thing. Whereas in class, you know, you, you don't have any homework, so that might be appropriate for people who need their time scheduled and, you know, maybe just have too much work to be able to fit in the training on their own schedule. We've also got live classes versus pre-recorded. Live tends to um, result in greater engagement, greater follow-through from attendees. On um, our experience, pre-recorded classes, you know, it's easy to buy a pre-recorded class for 50 people. In practice, maybe only a couple of them will actually go through a noteworthy number of those videos. Um, whereas live classes, you can uh, expect things like attendance, especially if it's an employer sending their employees. They can potentially send ten employees and ask for a report on, you know, give us, tell us who is attending, tell us how much, you know, whether they're completing assignments, that sort of thing. Um, but not just in terms of accountability, um, they just Sometimes the camaraderie and uh, the environment um, leads to the follow through. Um, additionally, pre recorded is much lower cost than live, um, but the material can be less tailored to the audience and it may also be a little more out of date. Um, the Drupal project has actually been evolving surprisingly quickly over the past uh, few years. Um, you know, single directory component was introduced in Drupal 10.1. It was a module you had to enable. But as of 10.3, it's not even a module anymore. It's always enabled, you cannot turn it off. These are things that, pieces of information that are likely to be out of date in recorded training, because it's difficult for the recordings to be updated every minor release. Uh, but in a live class, you should have an expectation of the trainers to teach you whatever is current, and maybe to point out the things from a few months ago. Of course, in the live class, you can ask questions. And um, at the beginning of any live class I do, especially if it's a small group, I like to ask the background of all of the participants. You know, I find out, OK, you are maybe all web developers. Right? So I'm not going to spend much time teaching HTML, CSS, for example. Um, essentially, the instruction can be tailored to the audience in a live class. We've also got short term and thorough courses. You can have a half an hour class, again, like we have a three hour class, half day, full day, etc. Um, and then we have thorough, we have the boot camp type courses. So at the OA Academy, we have that part time three month course. So that would be thorough. Um, and that, the, the thorough ones tend to be more immersive, tend to prepare you to be able to actually contribute to the work once it's once the course is completed, whereas short term might just give you the exposure to the courses and um, you might leave the course prepared to, uh, to, to continue your research but not quite ready to contribute yet. Right? In a one day course, you, you come out knowing what there is to learn, knowing what possibilities there are, but maybe not ready to apply it. So, lots of those options. So, generally speaking, you mix and match all of them, right? So, you pick short term, thorough, you pick flipped classroom in class, you pick 
live, recorded. Um, you, you combine all of those to determine which course um, you're going to take. Of course, the option may not always be there, right? Your perfect combination might not be there. But uh, those are the, the factors to consider. Um, now, like I said, um, people schedule calls with me and say, I want training, this is what I want. Um, and then after talking with them more, we often together come to the conclusion that that's not exactly the right training for them. So some of the questions we ask are, how many people do you want trained? And how specific or niche are the training requirements? So for example, I want you to train me to use this website that the vendors built for me. That, that is a different request than I want you to teach me how to use Drupal. Right? Using Drupal is general high level. Using my website that the contractors built for me will require your trainers to learn about our website first. The more niche, um, the more niche the request, the more you want to engage with something that's definitely live, um, and you want to involve the trainer in that essentially discovery phase of your project. Um, and then, what is the timeline like? You might have just gotten a new job, and you need to get ramped up quickly. Um, you might have inherited a Drupal project from vendors and have a flexible timeline. Um, so, Timeline will also impact whether you want to do something custom tailored or whether you want to sign up for one of those public trainings. And finally, um, what are the goals? Why do you want to train? Um, again, do you want to learn how to use a system that vendors built for you? Are you trying to save money because you are spending too much money on vendors and you want to do more of the work yourself? It's a very common request I get. Um, are you trying to build the entire project? Apps, right? I've worked with companies where maybe they have four websites, vendors migrating one of them, and they want to do the other, you know, another one of them for themselves. Um, and maybe you want to increase development velocity, so maybe you have developers who are just not very productive, um, or maybe your vendors are not very productive. Um, and finally, another very common request I get we have vendors, we've had them for years. They tell me things, and I don't know if I can trust them. I don't know if they tell me the truth. I don't know if, you know, things that they tell me are complicated don't seem complicated. Um, and you really, it's, it's really hard to give an answer to that if you don't understand how things are built. Because especially in something like Drupal, some things that are very complicated in other systems are, in other systems are really easy in Drupal. And vice versa, sometimes just moving a button to the left reformatting something is really complicated. So it's not always clear. So you want to know those goals. And to get to to get to your goal, you also have to ask, where are you starting from? And there's different questions you need to ask your team. So again, if I'm setting up a custom training for a company, I have questions. I say, how many people do you want to train? They might just throw a number out. 50. Um, and I'll say, okay, well, do you want them all trained for the same things? What are their backgrounds, etc.? We need to dive in a little deeper before I can give you a plan. Um, so, if you have a team that needs training, you need to find out what the proficiency levels are for various topics. For example, HTML, some people will, of course, have no experience. Sometimes your content editors will actually be pretty proficient at HTML. Um, maybe they don't have to write HTML from scratch, but maybe they are familiar with semantic incorrect or accessibility uh, in their HTML. Um, and if that's the case, if they can write HTML but not, but they don't have any knowledge about semantic correctness or accessibility, then they might write HTML for you that's going to get you, that's first of all not going to serve. Um, you know, visually impaired users, but it also might get you in legal trouble. You can't write HTML that is not accessible. Um, you know, I know this group of government, so a lot of people are in government. You in particular can't write HTML that's not accessible. So you need to be aware. It's not enough for them to say, I know HTML. Um, with styling, with CSS, 
Um, there's levels to that as well. Where are they now? Where do they need to be? Twig and Drupal also. So these slides right here, you know, if anyone wants to you know, ask their team, team members these questions, I put these here in the forum where you can take a picture with your phone and they're asking you to slide afterwards and they can provide you with them. Uh, but these are the levels that you're trying to find out from your team members. And those were mostly related to front end meeting. And we've also got command line, Git, and deployment workflows. Um, with Drupal, some of the things that you can see in the UI are things that you still cannot do unless you have some fundamental knowledge related to potentially even the command line, Git, and deployment workflows. Uh, for example, you know, the, the, the tricky thing about Drupal is, like I said, some things that look easy actually have a lot of baggage in them, and for good reason, typically. But for example, if I go create a view, this is one of the very common things, um, or even, like, let's even go simpler than that, a field of content type. You know, I had someone call me for training, and she said, oh, I, I am learning Drupal, I'm really good at it, I know how to have fields, content types, etc. We have a development team, they're building a multi-site for us, and basically they're too slow. I want to, I want to enable all of our content editors to have fields to content types whenever we want. And that's fine, okay, but I, I was like, okay, great. Give me a little more information about your deployment workflow. How are, how are your developers releasing updates to the website? Do they know you're adding fields to the website? Um, do, did they, and she said, yes, they know, I said, did they seem to have a problem with it, and did they seem to have a problem with the idea of other people adding, adding fields to the website? And she said, they didn't have a problem with me doing it, but they didn't want anyone else to do it. And these, these are all like loaded questions with a lot of information behind them. If you add a field, to are editing the configuration for your site, the configuration should get stored in the code. And as someone who is just editing through the UI, you're probably not doing that correctly. When the developers do work through code and make the next deployment, they potentially are going to wipe out everything you did. They're going to wipe out the leave all of your configuration, which includes the fields you added. So that's why these, there, there's layers to these things. Um, and it doesn't mean that, that, that adding a field is a complicated development task. But you have to be aware of the downstream impact. There's also um, you know, skill levels related to content editing, with CK Editor, with Layout Builder, and then with site building in general. Again, uh, that person I talked to mentioned they can do fields, content types, blocks, uh, but maybe they created a few. And there are ways for the developer to sort of unlock features for the content editors. The developer can exclude some of the configuration from the regular workflow. But they have to deliberately do that, and it's not, it's not necessarily a trivial thing, and not all developers will know how to do that. So in some cases, if there are very specific things you want to be able to do, right? I want to be able to create my own views. I love views. I can have filters. I want to search. I don't want to talk to a developer to do that. Your developer can give you that ability, but you don't, it, it's not as simple as flipping a permission. They have to actually do development work to exclude your view from configuration. So these things are, these are not things you're going to find from you know, reported training. I go to a reported training on views, I go to my developer and I say, hey, I know all about views, I know views inside out. Give me the permission. It's not enough, you need it, configuration, or your developer needs to build the site differently to give you that access. We would love training to be so complicated. Um, and then, you know, oftentimes you want to go to the next level. Maybe you are the developer, or you plan to be the developer on your project, um, in which case you likely want to get into module development. Um, so that would you know, comes using PHP, writing about module development, etc. So when people ask me for module development training, they sometimes will self-classify as saying I'm a, I'm a PTPA. When it turns out they're actually 
an experience, maybe experience Drupal 7 module developer, which means they know PHP, they know all the webhooks, um, but maybe they don't know object-oriented programming. So they might be level three in the first two categories. Or someone else might say, um, you know, I've, I can edit modules if I need to, when, yeah, which really might imply that they're level two for both of those categories. So we put some thought into all of these levels um, that you could ask your team members or yourself and try to break your knowledge um, to help determine what level, what type of training you need. And if you're level two, but you want to do module development, then you're going to need to learn three and four, and potentially two through four in the module development category. So that all brings me to what skills do I need to know to do what I'm trying to do? And unfortunately, this is such a big question. Um, you know, when people say, I want to do models, I want to do this, I want to do that. It's, it's such a big question. We're going to do various examples here to explain how doing something in Drupal doesn't intuitively match what you need to know. So here's one example. Enabling a module. Um, and this includes modules like Common Drupal Core or modules you download. Through the UI, it's just a checkbox. And so you might think, I can check a checkbox. I'm really good at that. I'm going to check that checkbox and press install it. Why are you why are you preventing me? You know, you, you, you probably you'll feel like a teenager feels when a parent doesn't let them have a sleep. Like it's so easy. You can just say yes, and I can do it myself. But if you do it yourself and you don't use it, you don't use the composer, and you don't use configuration management, you are creating a problem for the future. So for example, Drupal actually very recently removed the download of modules screen. But until very recently, there was, in the, in the admin toolbar, there's a link that says extend. And if you click on that link, it takes you straight, straight to a page that says install a module. And it asks you for a URL to a zip file or a tar file. People would get that URL from Drupal Lower, upload using that form, and it would download the module, add it to your modules folder, and great, you just have a module with Drupal Lower. And then they check the box and enable it. There are, and it's all in Drupal Core, so you think this makes sense, this should work, but in reality, downloading the module through that form is bad practice ever since Drupal 8. Um, and it's bypassing Composer. Composer's job is to download modules, download Drupal Core, to make sure they're compatible with one another. But not only to make sure they're compatible, but also, in the future, if your developer downloads a different module or your developer updates Drupal Core, Compose is going to delete anything that wasn't downloaded with Composer. So it's going to actually go and automatically delete any modules that were downloaded through the UI. So if you went and downloaded a module through the UI and enabled it, and then a week later, your developer uses Composer to update a different module. The module you downloaded is going to be gone, but you enabled it, and Drupal is looking for it. So Drupal will look for it, it won't find it, and your whole site will crash. So you have to, if you want to be able to enable modules, you have to be able to use Git, whether it's through the command line or otherwise. You need to be able to use Composer for modules from Drupal Network at least. And you need to use configuration management to export your changes to code so that they can be tracked by Git and so that they don't get overridden on the next deployment. Adding fields. You need to use Git and configuration management. So pretty much any setting you change will require both Git and configuration management. Because anything you do through the UI that's not a content change is typically a configuration change. Therefore, it must be exported to code after you do it. And anything, any code change needs to be committed by Git. So you can sort of just take that rule and apply it across the board. Anything that looks like a setting needs to be tracked by Git and use configuration management. In this case, we also list data modeling because 
you can add fields, but you can add the wrong type of field. Um, it's, you know, there's text fields, there's reference fields, there's different types of references. Um, and, you know, I've worked on so many projects where the wrong field type is selected. Sometimes it's a trivial thing, maybe you pick a text field when it should be an email field. It'll work, but you won't get the email validation. But in some cases, it's Worse than that, maybe you pick a text field when really you wanted a reference field. So for example, something I'm working on right now, helping with the migration, uh, they, they have their uh, front-end developer who's not, who has to use Google before, creating all the content types, and he went and created text fields for pretty much everything that could be typed. So for the authors of the articles, it's a text field. And what they found, and this, he did this years ago, really, on Google 7, and um, the site's been around for so many years, but now we see the author is always connected as a text field, and so there's no centralized reference to a single author's articles. Right? We can't see all of the articles by this author. So part of the migration, we're transforming from a text field to a reference field. Um, but you want to avoid these issues up front. But sometimes it's not as easy as a quick transformation. Another example would be an address field. Um, sometimes people will just make a big text box and say, and call it address. Um, but there, there's a module called the address module, which allows you to put an address that's formatted appropriately. And if you use the right field type, you can transform that into a, you know, a, a pin on the map, for example. Um, so if you use the right field type, you might get benefits that you're not even expecting at the time of creation. There's also NX content editor skills, uh, which maybe they can use the CK editor, they know how to use all the options up there, they also know how to go to the source and change the HTML. So this one doesn't need yeah, so it doesn't need configuration because this is a content level change. So sometimes you have a content editor who wants to be able to do more and they think let me have fields, let me do X, Y, Z. Um, but it might be actually most appropriate to train them in CK Editor, in HTML, to work with their developers to give them more capabilities within that context and you know, to enable them to do more. Um, that's, you, know, you can also go the wrong way with that approach, but it all, it all depends on what you're trying to do. Uh, views, I mentioned views. Um, views is a skill in itself. Views is the query layer for Drupal. It's essentially an abstraction over database queries. So you can create queries through the views module. Um, advanced dynamic list basically refers to advanced views, where the editor runs how to use relationships, contextual filters, and more. Um, and again, you need to know Git and configuration management to use this in a standard way. You could work with your developer to make exceptions for certain views or for a view so that they can enable content editors to modify a view or two, uh, which without having to get the configuration or anything. Another example block type. Like adding fields to a content type. If you wanted to create your own block type, it's similar to creating your own content type. Get configuration management and uh, the data modeling or lots of configuration in general. What about style of the component? So in this case, we've got the teaser display from the DYU Academy website, not for the free one, of course, that's not curious, so it's great. <laughs> um, but uh, in this case, to do that, you would need to know Twig and HTML, you would need to know CSS, you might need to know SAS if your project is using SAS, you would need to know Git, you would also need to know configuration to you know, configuration code to be able to manage the display and pass the appropriate field values. So you know, again, sometimes uh, people will are thinking, I'm really good at the CK editor, I want the ability to style teasers. And it's like, okay, you do have some fundamental skills that map well, but there's a big gap. You not only do you need to know Git configuration management, CSS and Twig. You also need to have access to the deployment workflow. You need to have access to the code. Right? It's not something you can do through the UI. 
And finally, implementing brand new functionality that might not be available in the group before or compared. So this refers to basically module development. You don't need to know PHP at a minimum, um, PHP and Git at a minimum. Uh, but you might need to know object oriented programming, more advanced module development techniques, configuration management, depending on what you're trying to do. Um, so in this picture, we have a, there are all pictures from Drupal, of course. This is a Drupal website. Um, which has a form for selecting different subscription plans. The form is created partly through the UI, with configuration management, you're using a field, um, but there's module development here so that depending on which value they pick, it makes a call to start it to process the payment. So these are things that would not be easy through standard means. Um, there are, of course, lots of ways to do things in Drupal. There's, you know, I'd like to say there's five ways to do everything in Drupal, and three of them are best practice. Um, so, for something like this, you could do custom code, but you could use the rules module, or you could use the, um, yeah, ECA, yes. Um, yes, ECA module is like an alternative to the rules. I need those three approaches, and, you know, they can all be completely valid approaches. Um, the, the rules in the PCA modules allow you to do less or no coding knowledge. Um, they allow you to have conditional logic that talks to Drupal. So, lots of information. <laughs> what, you know, what do you need? We try to put this into a Venn diagram. It's honestly very you know, hard to fit in that way. Um, but um, hopefully this was somewhat helpful in determining, you know, these are in determining trade-offs between different approaches for different classes, skill levels for assessing your team, that's one of the main, you know, or assessing your own knowledge. Um, one of the main helpful pieces of information you can give to a trainer, talk to a trainer, is to say, these are my levels of proficiency in these different areas, um, and these are the goals I'm trying to accomplish. I want to be able to edit context, I want to be able to edit views, etc. Um, and then, you know, if you're talking with a trainer who knows their stuff, then um, hopefully they can guide you through the options, they can point you in the right direction, whether it's custom training, public training, etc. Um, or whether the, the real solution might actually be editing your website and maybe working with your developers to create some safe paths for you to accomplish certain goals without writing code, without going through the full workflow. Um, so, you know, like I said, this, this talk was made to sort of somewhat mirror some of the conversations that I typically have and um, some of the considerations you need to go through when determining what type of training that you need. Um, and I left some extra time and said, we have various public trainings on theoreticality.com. The courses in the main menu, you'll see the full list. Um, and if you'd like to get in touch at a later time, you can always scan the QR code. It's a little, it's a simple contact form. Feel free to reach out, you know, put your email, and let us know what to follow up with. I'm happy to get on the call and you know, see what makes sense for you. Um, you know, in my experience, uh, you know, most people tend to go over public courses, but if you have a team, um, I've seen a team that has little, as small as three people do this, but if you have a team, typically five or more um, developers, you might be interested in doing a custom training where we can schedule it um, on your schedule. One, one thing I've seen quite a bit is to become a Drupal developer. Of uh, course, it's three months, two, three hour classes per week. When companies reach out, they sometimes are actually looking for that training, but they don't want it to be three months and two, three hour classes a week. So we can then sit down to maybe three weeks, so 20 hours a week, 40 hours a week, something like that. Um, you know, we've had, we've had uh, you know, various person person. We've had some government trainings where we flew to them, did everything in person, 40 hours every week or 40 hours every other week to ramp them up. We've had people who want to take it a bit slower and, you know, do three classes a week, three hours each class to, you know, more gradually ramp them up. It really depends on your organization's constraints, timeline, and preferences. Um, 